from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text, I've, as I've indicated, is our epistle reading from Hebrews chapter 3. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the text. The Christian friends, uh, there's no greater description of God's gracious working in the lives of believers than Martin Luther's explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed in his small catechism. Here's how he describes the Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified, and kept me in the true faith. We Lutherans put a strong emphasis on the fact that the Holy Spirit calls us to faith by means of the gospel, and rightly so. After all, we are, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter we are dead in trespasses and sins. And now, as Luther goes on, and cannot by our own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ or come to Him. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He creates the faith that unites us to Jesus, whether through the water and the word of holy baptism or the word of the gospel that is spoken or read. While beginnings are essential, obviously we can't finish what we never started, we dare not overlook the ongoing work that the Holy Spirit performs, keeping us in the faith. He's in the faith business from start to finish. All His work would be for naught if we didn't continue believing, if we didn't remain faithful until death. Revelation 2.10 or in the words of our text, hold our original confidence firm to the end. The author of Hebrews, we don't know who that author is, there's different speculations, but the author of Hebrews points to the sad reality that some who started well did not end well, citing the example of the Israelites who had left Egypt under the leadership of Moses. You remember them. They had been in bondage to the Egyptians for 430 years. God comes to the rescue. He calls Moses to go to Pharaoh and demand, let my people go. Pharaoh agrees, but only after ten plagues force his hand, the last of which is the death of the firstborn of Egypt. All goes well until Pharaoh has a change of heart again, and sends his army in pursuit of the Israelites. They end up caught between a rock and a hard place. The Pharaoh's army behind them, and the Red Sea in front of them. Go back, you're slaves again. Go forward, you drown. Well, God rescues them in spectacular fashion. The sea is parted and the Egyptian army destroyed. Now, you would expect the Israelites to be eternally grateful for their deliverance. But that's not what followed. It's the wilderness period which followed that becomes the focus of the writer to the Hebrews. Moses recorded those events, particularly on the pages of Exodus, also in the book of Numbers. 
what transpired there in the wilderness was a tragedy, a travesty, and the writer of Hebrews cites it as a warning to his readers, lest they fall into the same trap. There's a lot at stake. He doesn't want to see them fall away from the living God, the God who rescues and delivers. To make his case, the author of Hebrews quotes from Psalm 95, which looks back at that earlier time. In fact, this is the second time in chapter 3 that he quotes from the psalm, having cited more verses from the psalm just prior to our text. Here's the fuller version, verses 7 through 11. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, well, isn't that interesting? As the psalmist writes, but as the Holy Spirit, working through the psalmist, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts, they have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. My rest. God promised Israel entrance into Canaan, the promised land. But they would have to wait. Wait 40 years before that promise could be fulfilled. But it would not be the generation that left Egypt that would enter the land. Not even Moses. Of the 600,000 men over 20 years of age who stood, stood safely on the opposite shore of the Red Sea at the beginning of the Exodus, only Joshua and Caleb would eventually enter the Promised Land. That's because all the rest had hardened their hearts in one way or another and participated in what the psalmist calls the rebellion. The rebellion. A sad history of the people's grumbling, disobedience, and turning to idols. Early on, the people became impatient for Moses to come down from the mountain. They asked Moses' brother Aaron to build them a golden calf, which they turned into an idol. How's that for a bad start? Hold on, there's, there's more to come. Even though God provided manna for the people to eat, they found reason to grumble. Then there, there, then there was Rephidim, where the people grumbled because they had no water to drink, complaining bitterly against Moses, but ultimately against God. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Of course, God comes in and provides them water to drink, but yeah, okay. If it wasn't one thing, it was something else. That wasn't the end of it. There was the rebellion recorded in Numbers chapter 14 where the people refused to enter the promised land. Having arrived at the border, Moses sent in 12 men, one from each tribe, to spy out the land of Canaan. They did as they were assigned. They scouted the land for 40 days. Upon their return, the majority of the spies brought back a disheartening report. Yes, the land flows with milk and honey, but the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified <laughs> and very large, they said. Caleb, one of the two spies, the other being Joshua, who was not intimidated, countered the bad report, saying, we are well able to overcome it. The other spies repeated their negative assessment, putting the people into a panic. Joshua and Caleb make a final plea to the people. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. 
but to no avail. Actions have consequences. As our text says, the Israelites were unable to enter because of unbelief. The people would now be forced to wander for 40 years in the wilderness, one year for each day they spied out the land until all those who refused to enter had died. Could it happen again? The Saba certainly thought so. That's why he highlights those events years later in Psalm 95. Could it happen again? That's what the writer of the Hebrews feared. A repeat performance in his day. A repeat performance by Jewish Christians who were in danger of reverting, reverting back to the Judaism from which they had come, thus falling away from the living God. The danger was real. Their conversion to Christianity put these Jewish Christians at odds with their community and culture. By joining the Christians, they lost the protection that was afforded to the Jews, but not the Christians, by the Romans. In his Hebrew commentary, John Kleine describes the pressure put upon these Jewish Christians to return to their roots. The use of slander, social discrimination, physical abuse, exclusion, imprisonment, and confiscating of property. Could the same falling away from the living God happen today? We would be naive if we thought otherwise. The words of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians certainly apply. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And so the same call needs repeating today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. The deceitfulness of sin hasn't changed over the years. Then as now it can lead to an evil, unbelieving heart. Just think of those who were deceived, who succumbed to its deception at the time of the Exodus. The author of Hebrews hits hard with a series of rhetorical questions. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? The implied answer, yes it was. And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Yes, it was. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Well, this time answer given, but to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The ones who rebelled are the very ones who had witnessed, who had experienced God's providence and protection. Of all people, they should have known better. And yet they fell for the deceitfulness of sin that produced evil, unbelieving hearts. The fact that the writer speaks of the hardening of hearts points us to a process, a process over time. It typically doesn't happen all at once. Satan, the great deceiver, chips away at our trust and confidence in God, gradually turning up the heat as those Jewish Christians, as you and I today, face the trials and tribulations of life. We cited earlier the kinds of pressures and challenges that those Jewish Christians faced in their cultural setting. We live in, we live in a different time but similar pressures and challenges face us today or could face us in the future. How many times haven't we been tricked by the deceitfulness of sin? Better to play it safe than risk pushback or worse yet, for openly expressing our Christian faith. 
in today's culture. It's enough that I have my private, personal, me and Jesus relationship is how we rationalize it. Our faith takes a further hit when we no longer think of our baptism as having relevance for the present. We regard our confirmation as the culmination of our Christian instruction rather than the place from which to keep on growing in the grace and knowledge of God. We miss a few Sundays from worship and notice that the sky hasn't fallen. So uh, a few more Sundays won't hurt either. By the grace of God, we will not forget the Spirit's gifts which we enjoy through the means of grace. What is it that we have experienced of His provision and protection? He gives us gifts that grow our faith, that keep us in the faith. By the grace of God, we have come to share in Christ. We have been baptized into His death and resurrection. We have been granted newness of life. We hear the absolution spoken in the stead and by the command of Christ. We partake of Christ's body and blood in the sacrament for the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of our faith. Through these gifts of grace, the Holy Spirit provides powerful help along the way as we journey to the promised land that awaits us. But our text points us to something in addition. <coughs> the one that we need all the help we can get. Did you catch it in the text? I'm talking about the gift, the great gift of one another. And the support that comes when we deliver words of edification and encouragement to one another. Exhort one another every day as long as it is called today is how the writer to the Hebrews phrases it. Well, it's still today because the Lord has given each of us the gift of life today. You notice there's a sense of urgency in the writer's words. The same as when Jesus said, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Today may be our last today, our last opportunity to carry out this special work on behalf of our brothers and sisters in the faith. We are, after all, the church of one another. Because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we do not live in isolation, this me and my Jesus kind of faith. We serve one another. We love one another. We pray for one another. And yes, we exhort, we encourage one another. When we see a brother or sister falling prey to the deceitfulness of sin, we speak to them, admonish them, warn them of the danger of falling into sin or drifting from faith. Perhaps we point them to a biblical example, as did the writer to the Hebrews, to make our point. Where there is remorse, repentance, we point them to the forgiveness which Christ has earned for them by his cross and empty tomb. Likewise, when we see a brother or sister in distress, we encourage them, we comfort them, and we support them in their need. In every case, we point them to Christ and the promises of God. Lo, I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. My grace is sufficient for you. The writer to the Hebrews models exhortation later in his letter when he says, 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He continues with further encouragement. And let us consider how to stir up one another, there's that word, one another, stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, oh, there it is again, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day, that would be the day when Christ returns for judgment, when you see the day drawing near. Take care for yourselves, the writer of the Hebrews says, but quickly shifts to the care and concern we have for one another, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We do so by exhorting, by encouraging, at times by pointing to biblical examples as a warning, but always pointing to Jesus and to the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who has called us to faith and kept us in the faith to the end. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.